But again, we tend not to realize how different these things are. <coughs> Theodore Roosevelt, the first president to ride in a car, although he would be followed along the Hartford parade route by a horse-drawn carriage just in case there was trouble, and would be praised the next day by one newspaper editor for, quote, the display of courage typical of him. <laughs> by about 1900, uh, there were, in fact, 4,000 cars that had been manufactured in America. Three-fourths of them were steam and electric. Again, if you'd had a government study in 1899 of the most probable system for propelling cars, it probably might well have come out steam. Would not necessarily have come out gasoline. It was not obvious in 1899 that gasoline would work. There are a couple of other examples of this, though. In 19, and this is, again, so hard to get across in the age of the welfare state and the counterculture. Success grows out of failure. Remember the, the Edison point? We've had 9,000 experiments that we now know don't work. That's progress. And think about the mindset. In 1900, 38 new companies began production, another 47 the following year, and 57 more in 1903. But others were falling by the wayside. 27 companies failed in 1903, 37 more in 1904. Already in the field were Franklin, Pierce, Locomobile, Packard, Stanley, names to conjure with in the future. In 1903, a former carriage maker named William Durant bought the Buick Company and made it the centerpiece in a grandiose plan to assemble the combine that would eventually become General Motors. Ransom Olds, for whom Oldsmobiles are named, stole a march and all the producers with his vision of a cheap, small car, the curved dash two-seater Oldsmobile, costing $650, including mudguards, a friendly and familiar car of the sort that inspired popular songs. At this historic moment, Henry continued to put his efforts into racing, hoping that a fast car would attract potential investors. He talks about how he built the uh, cars, and he actually won races, and that was the beginning. So here's a guy who has to win a race to raise the money to create the company which invents mass-produced automobiles, which lowers the price of cars, popularizes the automobile across the entire planet, and invents the modern automobile age. And he begins working at night after working all day in his garage. Compare that to the modern attitude. If you don't subsidize me, how can you expect me to do it? If you don't loan me the money, how can you expect me to do it? It's exactly wrong and exactly not the way the real world works. The, which, which gets me to the question I want to close with for this first hour. How does a pro-invention and discovery way of life work? What I want, that's what I want you to think about. For, from, for, just ask yourself for a second. I mean, think about the, the stories we've heard so far about Edison, about Henry Ford. Think about the models we've looked at in terms of change. What kind of attitude would you have if this was a society that every morning decided that we wanted all of our citizens to have an, you know, a vision of themselves inventing the future? What would some of the characteristics be? Ask yourself. How would you wake up? How would you confront life? What would, you, what would your mood be? What, what, would you, what would you think like? Not necessarily what would you think about. You'd want okay. to get up in the morning. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, you'd want to get up. Now again, psychologically, think of the person on welfare who has all day long to invent the automobile, but they have nothing to get up for because, it is, because we haven't found a way to plant inside them this sense of... of Wanting to go. Somebody said you'd be optimistic. Of course you would. 9,000 down, 41,000 to go. What a great business. Quest for knowledge. You'd, have, you'd have a quest for knowledge. Huh? Doesn't fear motivate it sometimes? Sometimes. You know, what's a good example of fear? Hunger. Afraid of hunger. Afraid oh, hunger's a good you. example. It is. Uh, when you, got, when you got meals put on the table, it's made that's, that, 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 that drives entrepreneurs. Putting the meal on the table drives the entrepreneur. Mortality. Show me a fear that would drive the inventor. Mortality. Mortality. Can I discover a cure for cancer? I mean, the number of people who have a member of their family who gets sick, and that's why they're research biologists. Somebody has a friend who goes blind, and that's why they go to work on inventing a computer for the blind. Or somebody has a friend who's in a car wreck, and that's why they go to work to invent a better way to rehabilitate. I mean, fear is a real component. What other kind of motivations? Curiosity. That's right, curiosity. I mean, a big motivation we turn, tend to be, if it's not beaten out of us, and beating, then the beating can be cultural. I mean, it, it, one of the great problems we have now in the inner city is the kids who do well are often literally attacked by kids who aren't doing well. 
So they're psychologically under barrage. I mean, you can beat out of people healthy behaviors. But curiosity is a natural human behavior, it seems to me. What makes and it's one of the things that keeps me going is I get up every morning curious. I'm just, you know, what'll happen next? It's a, <laughs> looking for cookies. <laughs> uh, looking for cookies. Yeah, since I'm psychologically four years old and I'm always looking for cookies, you know, I wake up in the morning. No, and this, 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 my, I think my, my aunts and my mother and my grandmother's <coughs> drilled into me that there's always a cookie somewhere. It's, it's my variation on the old Reagan story about the, the, the kid who was looking for the pony. I mean, you know, that I, I wake up in the morning and go, not just cookies, but it will be interesting. A cookie will be under a dinosaur or something. I mean, you get it. You know. So I live, I don't even know, you know the, the cartoon about the kid who has the tiger? The, what's the? Calvin. Yeah, Calvin. I mean, my wife read one of those one day and said, okay, I get it. And handed it to me because it was, what part of they both become, they both go on back and they were being chased by a tyrannosaurus and they were running on. That's how I live my life. I'm permanently fascinated. I mean, I, I once had this fantasy, I'd be Speaker of the House. And it's, you know, and so I, I, one of my best friends said, I, I was the only person who knew who walked into rooms, he heard trumpets, whether they were any or not. <laughs> and so you have this energy that comes out of the idea of, wow, this will be exciting. But, but notice, see, in the modern age, all too often, what we say to people is, well, be practical. Be reasonable. Well, look at the people we're looking at. I mean, do you think, can you imagine a modern therapist dealing with Edison? <laughs> This fruitcake thinks that 9,000 failures is a great start. Or talking to Henry Ford, this guy is so incompetent he can't even plan a car small enough to get out of the garage. I mean, he literally knocked down part of the wall of the garage. That's right. Yeah, I mean, he was not a young guy. I mean, he, he was already on, but just think about all the things that your, your vocational counselor at school would tell you. You really want to go off with your brother and fly what? I mean, and this is my point. There's a dull grayness in the counterculture and the modern bureaucracy and welfare state that says, oh, don't break out. Conform. But out here, or you can break out if you want to be a performance artist doing something weird. But don't break out if you want to be an inventor, a scientist, a discoverer. But the great breakthroughs are out here. They're the people who say, I think I'll be nutty for five years. I think I'll just go and work on bread mold, penicillin. Or I think I'll go work on inventing an airplane instead of being just a bicycle mechanic in, in Toledo. Or in Dayton, rather. I mean, it's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that kind of thing. And so what I'm partly saying to you is almost all of the spirit of invention and discovery is in our minds, and our minds are shaped by our culture. And so the question is, how do we, and we're going to come back to this in the second hour, how do we now come back and make American civilization healthy so that every child in America male or female, any ethnic background could say, I could be Edison, I could be Carnegie, I could be the Wright brothers. Because the real answer is, why not? If that's the game you want to play, if it's the contribution you want to make, go for it. Have a great time. Not guaranteed to succeed. We're guaranteed the right to pursue happiness. And we'll pick this back up when we come back uh, in a few minutes. Mm -hmm.